Hi, good evening. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here online today. Uh, my name is Allison Hussey. I am a staff writer at Pitchfork, and I'm here to talk about the future of jazz with some really wonderful artists. Uh, we're doing this in conjunction with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing our panelists. We're going to start off with Cecile McLaurin Salvant. Uh, Jen Xu and Samora Pender Hughes, and we're just going to talk about what they've been working on, uh, what's been going on in the world, and how they've brought that into their work. Um, and we're just going to jump right in here. Uh, so, if we could first start by talking about Cecile, um, you know, how did you first get interested in jazz, or you know, how did it come to you? And if each of you could like work through this, I'll start with C Cecile. Um, I think. My mom is really the first uh, person to uh, introduce me to jazz. She listened to a lot of music from all over the world, including jazz. She was, I mean, she is a huge fan of folkloric music, and I consider jazz a part of that. And so it was mostly thanks to her. Mm -hmm. And Jen, how about you? Um, I would say it's because of my parents that I started studying music. Um, but they were not definitely not musicians. Um, they loved music, though. My dad somehow in Taiwan um, fell in love with Western classical music and brought that passion over with him um, to the U.S. And then my mom um, loved folk music and Judy Collins, Simon and Garfunkel. And so growing up with that, um, learning classical piano and violin was something I think uh, second generation Asian Americans often did. Mm -hmm. And um, and then that grew into um, musical theater and singing. And then through musical theater, I kind of found um, the songs of Cole Porter and Cy Coleman and kind of entered into jazz in that in that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, and Samora, how about for you? Yeah, I mean, I um, I definitely like was introduced to music first through the home, family home and basically every type of music was on it in the house. And I think the first jazz musician or person, I don't, it's perfect for me actually because the first musician that might be considered in that space uh, that I listened to was Nina Simone, mm -hmm. who is like, you know, one of my greatest inspirations because, I mean, among many other things, she just speaks to the times in her work and also she can't really be categorized as anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think I, I got that early. And then as far as studying the music more, um, that came when I went to this program called the Young Musicians Choral Orchestra, mm -hmm. which at the time was called Young Musicians Program. And uh, that's a, it was a free program for um, young people where you got all this different training. And I had a teacher named Geechee Taylor who basically turned me on to Miles, turned me on to Herbie. Once I heard Herbie, I was like, oh, piano, okay. Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing. <laughs> Cool. Um, and yeah, kind of springing from there, um, I'm interested in hearing about like what each of your experiences were like with formal music education. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of positive aspects to this, but sometimes these structures are not necessarily set up in a way that favors or rewards like people who want to think kind of like beyond the bounds of genre or anything else really. Um, so yeah, like for better or for worse, like what was your musical education experience like? And some more, since you were just kind of there, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the Young Musicians Choral Orchestra, that, that time was the part in my life where the conception of formal music education really worked the best for me. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily think it was because it was formal, but more because it was consistent and it was still community-based. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the thing that was maybe lacking in other situations I've been in that have to do with that is that sometimes they feel very cold mm -hmm. to me personally and so that space was really more of a welcoming space it was basically like a home like for a bunch of kids that like wouldn't be able to study music otherwise mm -hmm. and all just super passionate and i think also just all super grateful because it's like we want this so bad mm -hmm. and this place is giving us you know all of this to be able to do it for real mm -hmm. um and so I think that was the best, yeah, the best version of that. And I think it also was lucky for me because even though I was really there just to play piano, they let me be a composer. Mm -hmm. And that really made me think that I could do it. And we'd have all these older 
elders, you know, Frank Foster and like oh, just old, you know, cats like come out and just be like, yes, you can do this. Just mm -hmm. study this and da, da da. And so I think that was the best version of it for me. For me, like later in my life, you know, going to higher education spaces and things, um, I think the biggest criticism I had of it was just that they never asked me why. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it was almost like it was like a trade school thing or something, which I don't knock at all. And I think I got I'm really grateful for the training that was present. But I think the training is necessary, but it has to come with the why, mm -hmm. because I think if, if it doesn't come with the why, then um, number one, it can feel like you're very divorced from your, you know, yourself and your soulfulness and even the ability to take risks and do things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that it kind of makes you feel like you need to fit in, mm -hmm. you know? And that was the biggest issue for me at different points in my life was that I often didn't feel like I fit in. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, for a long time, I kind of hid myself. And it's only recently that I've been like, no, you, should, you shouldn't have that reaction to being yourself. You mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jen, how about you? Yeah. Um, it's interesting, the, the word assimilation came in to my head because um, I think when I was thrown into studying ballet and classical piano and violin, you know, ballet I really loved. Um, piano, it became uh, more because of competitions and it, it became like the rigor of the training. And I don't, uh, it's kind of amazing that I went through that, um, yeah. but kind of, uh, I mean, I loved, you know, I'd watch um, the Van Cliburn piano competition on, and we'd tape it and then I would watch it to get inspired and I'd go practice and then, um, but I think the one thing, you know, that I was absolutely terrified of was improvising and which is so, f you know, kind of funny looking back um, on that time, but but yeah, that, that training did not allow it. And especially if you're competing, I kind of encountered my teacher later, it was an amazing pianist named Roger Shields, who uh, took from Salima Stravinsky, um, he was Igor's son. And mm -hmm. um, so that training he gave me and my brother, um, he kind of told me later uh, that, you know, Jen, the students I train, you know, their parents just want me to get, get them winning competitions. Mm -hmm. So there just wasn't room to mm. teach improvisation or or even to listen to the you know the great you know jazz musicians and mm. um and so that that was fascinating i never went through a school for that that was just like private lessons mm -hmm. i found my way there but um so with vocal training you know with musical theater that was more self-taught mm. i i definitely you know at that time i still had no identity, awareness of my identity. So it was still like, I want to sing like Sarah Vaughan and I want to sing like, you know, all mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the stars of those musicals back in the Phantom of the Opera, mm -hmm. is Miss Saigon, especially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to be Miss Saigon <laughs> for, yeah, I just really wanted to be on Broadway and be Miss Saigon. <laughs> it's like, that's the only role, right? For yeah, Asian crazy. Americans, right? Yeah, for, for a woman. So that was kind of the dream, mm -hmm. and at that time, um, but but the singing, the training, I, I didn't do training even when I first started singing, mm -hmm. but then because of the piano and violin, I guess, you know, my parents said, oh, maybe you can take voice lessons. So that was like art song and opera, and um, it took a while to kind of understand what I was, um, going to do mm -hmm. uh, at Stanford I studied op opera and um, and it really was through uh, meeting Asian American jazz musicians after graduating mm -hmm. um, who kind of guided me toward looking to my own ancestry mm -hmm. which never occurred to me before never mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that was I, I feel like my real education began um, just like oh being aware of even being Asian American, mm -hmm. and, um, and then being becoming interested in, well, what does the music of Taiwan sound like? And what about East Timor, where mom is from? Mm -hmm. and, um, and through the path, through kind of the models of, you know, Monk uh, being himself and, and, you know, 
bird being himself like I was like oh I want to try to be myself too mm. you know <laughs> and so that was how I found my roots mm -hmm. it's, it's through this circuitous kind of path so mm -hmm. I'm yeah okay like, yeah <laughs> <laughs> cool um yeah we'll certainly come back to you know talking about the directions that each of you have taken with your uh projects but Cecile I'm also interested in hearing about like your experience too because you went to school in France was that right I did um but this is so fascinating what you're saying about sort of coming to coming back to your family and to your ancestry as an adult. Yeah. Uh, because I feel like as I'm getting older, that's that's totally the case. Mm -hmm. um, I was not looking at <laughs> where my parents were from or what their mm -hmm. what their music was. I was I was listening to the music that they listened to growing mm -hmm. up, but um, I just feel like I'm starting to go down a path of of discovery of my own ancestry which is so strange because i mean i think i so i studied uh jazz vocals in france and um as like a black american woman it felt like people just expected me to sing that because they were like well that's you that's your that's your music of your people mm. and i was like well no my mom is french and my dad is haitian mm. they're not that's not their music yeah. you know um but yeah, I studied, I was really, really lucky with the jazz program that I was in because it was in a tiny, no offense, <laughs> in a small conservatory in the southeast of France. Mm -hmm. um, I had always listened to Sarah Vaughan and, and really great jazz singers growing up, thanks to my mom, but I thought it was a dead music that nobody played. Um, and I only ever heard on the radio or in, around Miami, like Latin jazz. I didn't hear many jazz singers mm -hmm. that were alive. I didn't really know it was something that people did mm -hmm. until I moved to France. And then I met all of these musicians that were my age. And, um, and I started getting into it and I had one teacher and he is a reed player. He plays clarinet and saxophone. He's not a singer by uh, any measure. And he taught me and he would, forced me to play the piano, which I did begrudgingly. And he would have lunch with me every Wednesday and tell me that I needed to practice. And he was, it was really a one-on-one -on -one, like intensive thing. He had no curriculum. He had no assignments. He gave me no um, pointers. He would just come every week with a tote bag full of CDs. <laughs> Um, and you'd say, do you know Bessie Smith? And I'd be like, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and just like, listen to this, put it on your, on your computer and listen to it. Mm. And we'd come to class and, and it was insane. It was like ensemble classes. So it was, you know, several instruments, maybe four of us. And we come to class and he wouldn't say a word. He would just sit, sit in his chair in the corner. And sometimes it was like a staring contest. Sometimes he would just look at us and after like five minutes of silence, we'd be like, like, so what do you want us to do? And you're like, I don't know. What do you want to do? Like, I don't need to spoon feed you. Like, what do you have to ask me? Mm -hmm. And so I was really lucky in that my first experience with this music was teach yourself, discover things yourself, ask questions, and don't wait for someone to give you all the techniques and all the ideas and all the, you know, really, really be an autodidact. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I feel really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. It was scary though. It was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds really intense, but also a lot of fun. Just yeah, it the was idea. Fun. Was... I mean, and he would he would do stuff like if if a student had issues with like the rhythm of something, he'd be like, "Well, just play the drums," and like they'd not play their instrument for a class and just play the drums. Mm. Or, you know, I I did a competition that I won and and for vocals, and he basically when I went back to the school was like, "Well, you won this competition for vocals, so you're not singing anymore for for the rest of your time here." So I was behind the piano for the next for the next <laughs> year. Wow. Terrible, That's but wild. you know, it was it was kind of a funky funky fun way to learn mm -hmm. that I think can only happen if you're not in a big school that's like no offense Aix-en-Provence I love you guys <laughs> but you know it's it's one one teacher with it, it with also like students. the way you talked about in the classroom for some reason it just makes me think of therapy you know it's like yeah. you know you gotta yeah like, like exactly. I'm here to give you the tools but you have to give something of yourself first yeah. to that's... like for us to get into it for real you know exactly yeah. that's exactly right <laughs> And I feel like so many times when we take private lessons or we take music lessons, I don't know if this was the case for you, but you kind of come in waiting for the teacher to yes. tell mm -hmm. you, like, okay, well, open to page four. Yeah. He would be like, 
well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. So kind of going back to something that we've already gotten close to, um, I want to hear about how like a sense of history has influenced how you approach your work. Um, I know, you know, Jen and Cecilia, you've both talked about like your family relationship with this. Um, and yeah, some more I'm interested in hearing too, just like, um, and maybe Jen, you could start by talking a little bit about your uh, Zero Grasses project um, and like what, how, how history came into that and you know, what, what each of you are doing that's kind of, that brings us in and you know, why take this approach? Yeah, well, it's, it's so powerful to hear you talk about you read, you know, discovering this, the, the path that your parents took, you know, and, um, you know, when I went to Taiwan for the first time, embarking on that journey, it was um, really emotional and, and kind of music was just this kind of excuse to go over there. Mm. And, and, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm really interested in the folk music of Taiwan and the indigenous music of Taiwan. Of course I was, but kind of the real stuff was sitting with my aunties, speaking Mandarin, mm. like consistently for the first time, you know, and it's, it's funny because our parents, I'm curious to hear your stories, but like, they, they might not have known, like my parents never, uh, they really wanted me to do Western classical music. Mm. I thought it was great, you know, and, and when I was getting interested in, you know, dad's homeland's music, he's like, hmm, like, is that popular? Is anyone going to understand it? And, and even my aunties, you know, I'd, I'd go out and do field work. I'd learn from Taiwanese moon lute teachers, elders, and, you know, this kind of really nasally singing and, and, you know, no tra no, no training, you know, it's, yeah. and, and, and my teachers would always say like, I, I can't read, I can't read, you know, because they weren't, you know, they couldn't read Chinese characters, but, um, so I, I, play my aunties like what I learned and they like um so and they would say things like oh uh hen hao ting ban shi bu xi huan like it sounds good but I don't like it because <laughs> it would remind them of 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 the farmers and the and the poor folks who would ask money like knock on their door and ask for money and they play a song and ask for money and so like I will never forget my fourth grand auntie said that like I played her this song I Took, it took so long to learn the pronunciation because oh I, I don't speak Taiwanese. I speak Mandarin. Taiwanese is much more difficult. And, uh, and I was so proud. And she's like, ah, it sounds good, but I don't like it. You know, <laughs> it's too close. Yeah, yeah. It, it really it brought up these kind of not great memories. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. And, uh, you know, it brought up wartime, right, right, um, yeah. colonization, you know, Japan invading Taiwan and mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I mean, it brought up war memories. And so that is so interesting to, to like, I, I always kind of blame my parents. Like, why didn't you um, make me speak Chinese? Or why, why didn't you teach me Taiwanese and Hakka? You know, I could have been like quadruple lingual by the time I was, you know, 12. And, um, and, and they're like, well, we just wanted you to speak really perfect English because yeah. we didn't get that chance, you yeah. know, when we came here and, and now you speak perfect English, no, no obstacles for you, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. So it's so powerful. I feel yeah. so, I feel, I totally feel what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I don't speak Creole, mm -hmm. which I am now really sad that I don't and I want to learn. Um, my, my grandmother's brother, uh, who passed away, mm. uh, taught Occitan, which is an old mm. uh, language from the southwest of France, which is from my, where my grandmother's from, right. never was interested in asking him, like, what are the songs? Like, and he mm. would sing me some of those songs. And like, how do you pronounce it? And now I'm calling my mom, like, how, how do you pronounce this, like, 1,300-year-old poem mm. in Occitan that I want to set to music? And she's like, well, everyone died. Like, oh, wow. you're too late, you know? Wow. And I feel, I, I feel a lot, like, I feel strange about that. I'm just like, wow, mm. I feel like I'm coming to this too late. <laughs> I mean, it's never too late. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. and I think there's a weird diaspora thing where you feel, I don't know if you feel this way, 
but where you kind of go back to these places and you feel like the American and you're like, totally. you're like, you know, for lack of a better term, you're like the white person, you know, yeah. like in yeah. Africa, they say that and you're, you're just yeah. like coming in with, you know, your questions mm -hmm. and your accent, maybe not even speaking the language yeah. and yeah. wanting to connect with it, but you're, you're foreign yeah. <laughs> and you're foreign here too, in a way. So right. it's just. It's such a trip. Yeah, I'm talking too much. No, 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 no. <laughs> absolutely. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I feel you know, my dad passed um, 2019, and the oh, album sorry, I, I created. It's okay, thank you. <laughs> um, but I, I created Zero Grasses kind of out of. It was supposed to be this other piece, and then I was doing research in Japan for this piece. It was supposed to be really just about climate change and mm. how humanity is um, still cannot solve this issue despite all our technological advances you know that was supposed to be that show and when my dad passed i was just doing research in japan learning biwa learning japanese and on my trip you know and then he passed suddenly and it's like oh okay gotta go take care of mom gotta stop my research and you know so i, I but i still had the premiere in the fall and and it just became an homage to dad mm -hmm. and yeah and there's so many questions like that i wish i could have asked him you know mm -hmm. and um so i told i told the makeup lady i'd cry but yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh um but yeah i think the the and it's called ritual for the losses and yeah. um i kind of i i was supposed to release it before you know but the pandemic happened and, and but it allowed me to add songs that I wrote during the pandemic. Um, mm. So there was a piece of, um, I worked with a choir, a middle school choir, and I had them write about, um, you know, quarantine. What did that mean to them? And they wrote, and then I compiled. Uh, I told them, well, I'm going to write music with your lyrics, and we're going to write this, you know, create this poem together. And, um, and so that spoke about this middle school angst in, in the most important, you know, kind of formative years where they, they're just, you know, cooped up in this small cage, you know, that, that's one of the lyrics that they, one of the, po you know, like poetic lines that they gave me and, um, and just like, yeah, politicians telling us they'd rather keep their economy intact than keep mm -hmm. us alive, you know, and like, just like, ah, 12 years straight old, from the, straight yeah. from, yeah, they know what's going on. And, um, and I also, wrote a song, A Lament for Breonna Taylor, um, kind of reading uh, just from interviews of her mother, speaking about how she was afraid of um, Breonna uh, getting COVID because she was a medical worker. And, um, and, and, and just that, that article was, it was a People Magazine article and just how tragic, you know, that that reading that was and reading Tamika Palmer's words um, about her daughter. And um, so, so the album became this ritual for the losses, um, confronting grief and, but talking about it, mm -hmm. and, um, which could segue into your project. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, Grief is not something that we typically make a good job for, or that we do a good job of making room for, kind of, I think on, like, culturally and kind of on an individual basis. I think a lot of people just, it's a difficult, it's a lot, and it's yeah. difficult to process it. Um, but I'd like to hear from you about just, like, what your relationship with that is, bringing that into your work, and you just spoke about it a little bit, but, you know, why channel grief this way? Me? Yeah, yeah. Right. some more, yeah. I think, we'll start with you since uh, Jen just spoke, but uh, yeah. your, tell us about your most, most recent project and how it reckons with grief. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for sharing that. And just in general, I mean, I think what I, I always appreciate among many things about both of you is just that you're just always honest. You know, mm -hmm. and and that's part of the of the grieving thing too. To mm -hmm. me, I think yeah. that's where I, where it started for me is that um, if you're being honest. Grieving is just such a complicated process. It looks obviously different for everybody, but mm -hmm. I think the one commonality, at least how I've observed it, is that it pretty much looks like everything. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, the project that year, Frank, I made a made an album called Grief that you know just got released this year. It was part of this larger project called the Healing Project, and um, I mean, it definitely does feel like obviously it's in the air, you know, from the last couple of years of just everyone, you know, it just touching everybody. Um, and I see so many artists, you know, responding to that and, and being real about that. But obviously in general, I think we all, you know, deal with it all the time. But I think that one of the things that made me want to write a lot about it was that um, it feels like the source of a lot of the um, or the epicenter of a lot of the things that we say are are wrong with people, but really they're grieving, you know, yes. and particularly for yes. black people and brown people, you know, and yeah. it's like, um, particularly because we essentialize people in certain ways, we demonize, we criminalize them in certain ways, um, when really they're grieving, that's yeah. what they're going through, you know, yeah. and so I think, you know, a big part of the healing project, which was based in all these you know, this five-year process of doing interviews around the country, um, you know, with different folks of all different ages that were moving through experiences with structural violence was just that um, so many people were grieving, but they just didn't, uh, they weren't given the, on the one hand, the society and the structure didn't give them neither the tools nor the options to grieve, which is part of what you're talking about. It's yeah. like, you don't, this is a, it's not on your timetable. It's like, get over it. You got three days, you got whatever you got, you got the funeral mm -hmm. and it's a wrap, you know? And it's like, that's not how it's gonna work, you yeah. know? And when, when you force somebody to do that, they sublimate it in different ways mm -hmm. and then it comes out however it comes out. Mm -hmm. But the other part, which was really beautiful and I think came to the personal for me was that when I started doing the interviews, I also realized that there were so many people that had those tools mm. and were using them in the community, um, you know, because like they were needed. And it was like, oh, this is where the information is for how what all of us need to be able to grieve properly. And it's so many like little details. I'll try to, I don't want to make it too uh, long, but the, a quick story is that. There was there's a woman named Sharon Hewitt who has since passed away who I interviewed for the project. She was like the mother of San Francisco, like everybody mm -hmm. knew her in San Francisco. And um, she told me a story as part of the interviews about like one of the days that basically one of the things she would do is that she would be a person that when somebody lost their child to violence, she would show up and they didn't know her or anything. And um, she described to me the process that she would go through when she shows up, like, cause they don't know her. And she's like, mm. I do this, this, and this. And she tells this honestly hilarious story about how she's basically like, I'm giving you this, like she gives them, you know, goes through a process with them. Are you getting this, what you need, what you need, what you need. And then also like, I'm gonna give you this money so you can buy toilet paper because everyone's gonna come to your house oh. and they're gonna like bring all this stuff and they're gonna use up all your toilet paper <laughs> and you have nothing left. And you're gonna be like, you know, grieving and you're not gonna have, wanna go to the store. Mm. and then call them late like a week later and they're like don't you know i didn't have no toilet paper like <laughs> da, 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 da. and she's like now they trust me and it's like they know i'm gonna show up and it was just like yeah. the most practical simple things you know yeah. and i just know when people have passed in my life like mm. those are the things that i appreciated the most when people were were present with it and i think there's a big culture around mm. like being present for somebody that's grieving but also kind of sidestepping it and just like not really not because people don't want to be there for you because they really don't know how yeah you know? yeah so that's kind of where where the album started and where the project got into that and mm. my hope is just that people will people who are grieving will be able to feel seen and heard in their grieving process and know that it's okay for it to be messy yeah. and also that hopefully they'll have some tools mm. yeah well I, yeah the um the woman you mentioned who just like shows up and just helps people out uh people like that are just like special i don't know like i don't yeah. that feels like, such a, like simplistic way to put it but it's just like it's simple though it's yeah. Really, yeah. <laughs> like simple. yeah just to be able to like show up for people and to like yeah. actually be able to like make a meaningful difference is like 
Yeah. It's huge. And not to, to continue too long, but that does go to the historical thing you were asking me about, because to me, that's the, also the importance of the archive mm -hmm. is because a lot of those people are not the people that are archived, you know, mm -hmm. those are not the people that like are written articles about, or, you know, that anybody knows. I mean, everybody knows them in the community, like mm -hmm. everybody knows them where they're from. Mm -hmm. And that should be the most important thing. But also I, I do find it, that is a beautiful thing to archive yeah. that and archive our stories, you know, all these things that. Um, wouldn't necessarily normally be in the historical record. Absolutely. Mm. Um, yeah, did either of you have like other grief thoughts you wanted to share before um, you keep moving? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that I have many other grief thoughts. I just think it's interesting that like I'm wondering now, did you call us? Is it is it jazz that connects us or is this this like yeah, this instead of being yeah, yeah. grief, like should we be like in a funeral? <laughs> like it's kind of an interesting thread among yeah. us. But mm. you know, all of our albums recently yeah. are dealing yeah. somehow or another with ghosts and grieving yeah. and loss and yeah. kind of crazy, right? Yeah, <laughs> thing in the air. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny to hear you say that too. But also, like, to think about that sense of like grieving and loss, but also not having it have this singular tone of being like super sad. Yeah. That like, yeah, that grief can that it does kind of have a lot of different colors to it. I don't know if that's yeah. like quite the right way to put it, but that there that like yeah. it is a different experience for a lot of people, and it's just. Yeah, each of you has a different approach to it, to it as well. Yeah. Um, and kind of building on what we, we were just talking about a little bit, um, I'd like to hear from y'all about the ways that community informs your work. And Samara, you've talked about it in a, little, in a bit more of like a direct and concrete sense. Um, but seal the way that you were talking about like the jazz classes or the like classes that you were in um, and the way that like being in a smaller school changed like your relationship with learning um and so yeah and jen the way that, that you were also speaking about like your aunties and um you know how did it, how does a sense of community shape like what each of you do that's a that's a tough question because it's it certainly does but um i for one am extremely uh I would say socially hesitant. I'm not anxious, but I'm I'm very much an introvert. So I often um, shy away from community, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Like I'm often like hiding from community, even though I know that's what I need. And I think these last few years have taught me how essential it is and how my soul needs it and how I often deny <laughs> the things that my soul need. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know if I mean that's all that's all I can say about it for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, community is such a big word. I mean, I also I feel the introvert um, that is my core, but then um, I feel like it's it also brings so much um, richness and informs informs me and inspires me mm -hmm. as well so um i think in if i think about community in my recent days um i know i mentioned this before but um with my wonderful co-founder sara serpa um we found we co-founded um, a mutual mentorship for musicians initiative and realizing that when we were in our 20s we, we really didn't have any, many, maybe one <laughs> woman mentor mm -hmm. um, to guide us and to kind of help us navigate power dynamics and, um, you know, what be it harassment or um, just microaggressions and um, and and so we we thought well as a community like what 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 did we want like what did we wish we had and um so this was kind of a, a way that we could generate that mm -hmm. kind of, that we had the ability to do so just getting together 12 
artists, some who I didn't know and some Sara didn't know. Um, and and just we wanted to see how we could make it work, like, you know, one on one mentorship as well as group kind of support and OK, let's do two meetings a month. Let's let's do three months. No, but then everyone wanted more. So, OK, we'll change it to six months. And it was this like constantly amorphous um, thing. And um, and and wow, I mean, just to have so much like kind of voices that I've never heard, um, mm -hmm. perspectives that I, I never considered, you know, in one room, Zoom room, <laughs> in one Zoom room, <laughs> um, you know, it was just, and all talking about our work, talking about our struggles and, and um, you know, what it was like to be, uh, you know, one of our court members, uh, starting out as a woman saxophone player at Oberlin and under, d experiencing all the, you know, kind of terrible traumatic stuff mm -hmm. and then later transitioning into a man and now being a saxophonist and how what that is like for him and um so i'm not being very articulate but but just realizing you know i think as we step back and i kind of and i think about wow the the, the number of amazing artists that just are not on the marquees or not on the headlines or not headlining festivals and yes. and as they should be and 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 we're talking women in their 70s mm -hmm. you know Shanta Narula is a sitar player from Chicago who is a storyteller never performed in New York and we're honoring her with a lifetime achievement award mm -hmm. this the, this festival so we're producing a festival in June <laughs> and so we have 19 women and non-binary and queer artists like it's just 19 artists doing four nights in a row, you know, five night, five sets uh, per night. One of the nights is four, uh, and then a gala evening. You know, so we're producing all this, and we're just like, we're creating it. We're, we're, we're making this, we're forming this community, we're growing the community, and, and kind of, we're bringing people into the community. And um, so, and giving voice to, mm -hmm. um, and this is like something I, I wanted to share too, is it's an anthology of writings from our first and second cohorts mm -hmm. um, of each cohort member. You know, we've commissioned them not only to create a music piece with a duo partner who they never worked with before, mm -hmm. but also to write, you know, an essay. So here we go, Sara is this motherhood and music in 10 steps, the invisible work of mother musicians. Oh, wow. And it's an, it's an amazing, essay and Sumi Tanoka is in here, uh, Erica Lindsay, Michelle Rose woman. I mean, you know, like, Great, yeah. ah, <laughs> it's like more people should know about Monette Sudler, you know, so our elder women musicians, like, where are they in the, in the, the, the kind of the narrative of, oh, the genius or the greats, mm -hmm. you know, they mm -hmm. are, they are, and they're, they're there. And so, yeah, so it's just kind of thinking about community, which I, def you know, definitely at, at 20, I was not, I was just like, how do I survive here? How do I find my voice? You know, it was kind of, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, yeah, it was just like, ah, <laughs> survival, <laughs> not drowning. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, very fortunately, yeah, I would say Doris Duke uh, is an institution that um, I feel so supported by. Um, that has allowed me to think more broadly and mm -hmm. think bigger. And um, did, what, did I tell you about the pizza analogy? Yeah. So, so instead of like, I want a bigger piece of pizza, it's like, oh, let's make the pizza bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually a skater uh, told me that analogy. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> skater wisdom. But um, yeah, so I, that's kind of what's on my mind when you say the word community. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I definitely, I definitely resonate with, um, I like how you said it, because I definitely say socially anxious. <laughs> I'm trying to not define myself as anxious anymore, although I definitely deal with anxiety. Yes. But um, I think for me, part of what I realized that was behind that, and I'm, I, this is a little bit of departure, but I do try to be honest about this sometimes now, is that 
like I really I think I had a running narrative and I still am trying to work out of having a running narrative that like I'm the worst and like no one likes me and no one is you know like it's really it's a, it's a thing and I don't know where it came from but it's like you know I think that I'm realizing that's part of what brought me to that you know fear of of building that community when really I did like desperately want it um mostly selfishly because I want to be accepted mm -hmm. but um you know so I'm working through that but I think as a result like community for me the way I came to it in the work was really politically mm -hmm. um mostly just because I I felt like I had to represent not had to but I wanted to represent a community ethic in everything that I did mm -hmm. so that it would not just um like be that artistically but that it would um, that I wouldn't be reproducing things that I didn't believe uh, believe in in capitalism and like but you know that I didn't believe in that solitary genius idea and I didn't believe in this like you know cult of celebrity and all these different things so like and also like even in the minute details of um, you know crediting and publishing you know these things that like you don't think about when you're a young artist and mm -hmm. then like a lot of you know my friends and different people that you know you get taken advantage of yeah. and i just never i just so desperately did not want to be on the other side of that you know mm -hmm. i was just like oh like yeah. i don't want to give another person this feeling you know mm -hmm. and and that was really like my greatest fear mm -hmm. um and and then on top of that i think you know i really didn't uh feel like I could do anything alone. I think if I like knew how to do some things alone, maybe I would have done them more because <laughs> I am also simultaneously a control freak. But, you know, I also like really desperately need people and it's become the most beautiful thing because that has become, you know, my greatest friends and has become all these different things. And I think this project has allowed me to then take it the next step to really feel it as a lifeline mm -hmm. um, for myself and for others. And, you know, being in correspondence with brothers of mine who are incarcerated mm -hmm. who like you know that's the only way we communicate you know um but uh through that process not only are we am i able you know we're sharing our ideas but also we you know support each other mm -hmm. um and that's kind of like mm -hmm. the biggest part for me okay yeah um so all of you are kind of this feels like not the best word to use for it but all of you i guess are like multi-hyphenates where all of you just have like many talents and do you know do more than one one thing um how do you in terms of like creative practices how do you kind of figure out like which threads you want to to follow with whatever kind of art you're making whether that's like a visual piece or like composing or performance i can go, with this. Yeah, I, go. <laughs> I mean yeah all the things but... <laughs> I mean, yeah, like it's it's just the best. I don't know. I just love having no boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just love having no boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. And it took me a long time to get to that point where I felt like I could have no boundaries with what I create and not think about what format it would take. And that was a big part of community too, because mm -hmm. part of the way that I was able to realize that was that I didn't need to have all the skills to make my ideas come to life. Mm -hmm. I just had to deeply respect yeah. all the other people that I was doing it with. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, I, it had to come from them as much as it had come from me. Mm -hmm. so and if we was doing that, then we're good, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there was so many ideas I had that they weren't music, but I'm like, I don't know anything. First thing about a camera, you know? Right. I don't know the right. first thing about wood uh, work, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. now I have wood pieces and now I got films, but it's yeah. also, it's because of these collaborators, you know, mm -hmm. the Christian Padrones and the Yoni Yasegas and, all these different amazing collaborators of Ashley Corn. So like making things with people allowed me to do anything that I want and mm -hmm. them to do the same because then I found out that a lot of them love music and they were like, but I don't play an instrument. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so that was like, th that opened up the whole thing. And then once it became that, it was just like, um, there's so many ways that I want to reach people, you know, and not all of them are possible just through sonics, you know? Mm -hmm. um, some of them are really powerful in that way and they don't work as well in other things, which I've also learned a lot about. Mm -hmm. I think particularly with like, I think it's given me a greater appreciation of music as well mm -hmm. because it makes mm -hmm. me really understand what sound does that sometimes yeah. 
yeah. visuality has a problem with because we're so attuned to certain visual languages mm -hmm. and we're just seeing it all the time and we can be, become very desensitized to certain yes. things. Mm -hmm. yes. And so it's like, actually, I don't really want to see that, but I can hear about it and really actually be moved in a different way. Yeah. And so that actually made me like go back into the music, but yeah. there's still certain things where if I want to tell a story or I want to just like, you know, represent an idea, it's not going to come off the same way with the music, you know? So I need that visual language. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I love that. I think I'm, I'm, we were talking about this before we got on, on camera. I'm like g getting back into music now. <laughs> like, I know that's probably sounds weird, but like I've really over the last couple months and years have, uh, discovered I, it feels like I've discovered it for the first time that it actually mm. is real and it does mm. stuff and it moves things and it's mm. there's nothing that can move a body and can animate a brain and a body the way music can and can mm. animate memory the way music can like mm -hmm. it's just yeah. unequaled mm -hmm. um, but I do feel very much like I'm a visual person first mm. and um, and I will say my uh, visual art practice comes from seeing my mom and my sister and my grandma um, make art all the time at home. Um, there, I just found out about this term called Sunday painters, which is just people who paint on Sunday <laughs> and they don't show the work it. oh. and it's just for them. And they're, they're weekly, they're not Sunday, they're like every day, but they don't, my sister has never shown her work. She's an incredible art, visual artist. My mom has never shown her work. My grandma's like, it's in the house. Oh, wow. um, and I, I remember growing up and weekends where my mom would be either painting or making a chair or doing lace work, learning how to do lace work, like oh. traditional uh, lace work from the Northwest of France. Um, with like the two last ladies who know how to do it, so um, and just it's yeah, so just constantly going into like learning a craft or um, and you know we say craft. I, I think it's art, but learning an art that that they don't know and just going for it and trying it and not having that pressure or even the desire for other people to see it. It's mm -hmm. totally personal. Um, and so I think I took a little bit of that. Um, and so I, it's, it's funny, it's like, it's multi-hyphenate, but I don't even consider myself that. I'm just, I'm just sort of doing what all these ladies uh, in my family do. Speaking of which, can we also just like shout out your mom? Yeah, shout out the jacket. Yeah. Shout out to the, <laughs> yeah. out oh, to the jacket my mom made. Oh, <laughs> that's so beautiful. Hi, mom. Yeah. <laughs> I love Amazing. it. Amazing. <laughs> I'm going to be a Sunday painter. Like yeah, that's, I was just that's that. my, when I, you know, in my next life, definitely chef and painter are what I. No, in this, in this life. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> now I, I think now I have a term that I can use. Sunday yeah, painter. Sunday painter. Just but it's also it like, myself. I kind of like using that idea even for music yeah. too. And just not yeah. being like, you know, just. I, I, I admire people so much who, who just do not, they just do it, do it to do it. humbly yeah. to do it, yeah. to spend the day. And it's, I think it's really beautiful and inspiring. And, and I know we all have people in our lives that do that, right? Yeah. We all have that. I'm sure in our process, we, I definitely yes. feel like in, even on stage, I've, I've gotten to the point where at some moments during the performance, or maybe the whole, the whole time, I'll just be in the most like raw or uncomfortable You'll be Sunday, Sunday space. Painter. <laughs> and, and that's, I kind of need that. Like if, yeah. if it's, I can't, even if I have a show that there's a script and there's lighting cues, like I, there has to be something that goes wrong. Yes. Cause then it's, then that's, you know, yeah. I'm not happy. Not I'm not satisfied if everything goes right. <laughs> but, um, but like, it's funny. Cause when I, uh, I think my first love is dance and that was my first actually i didn't improvise as a musician but as a dancer that's all i did so it was like wow, wow. ballet in the house i took ballet lessons of course and was in a, our local peoria illinois ballet school speaking of small you know <laughs> um and you know i did all the roles in the nutcracker and so dan i was felt totally free with movement and then i remember um like singing well when i began to connect those things i actually just through musical theater uh my but my instruments were still kind of off in the distance like 
well, that's that thing. That's where I sit at the piano bench and play that, or that's the violin mm -hmm. thing. And it wasn't until um, living in the Bay Area. Um, Bay Area. Yeah, Bay Area. <laughs> we really do uh, that. <laughs> Everybody does 10 things. Everybody like, does. No one exactly. does. Exactly. And, and that's when, you know, because my, even my piano teacher was like, Jen, you can't be a jack of all trades. No. You go to somebody in the Bay Area, they're like, what are you? I'm a poet. I'm a painter. I'm yeah, a painter. everything. <laughs> it's like, you're just a musician. No, no. What else do you do? You know, it's so that was the first time, like, I was given permission like permission and and was called upon to like play violin and dance and sing and i'll never forget the first gig i did that it was uh, doug yokoyama saxophonist in bay in the bay area and 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 he asked me to do that you know to, for his music and and after the performance one of my mentors john jang a pianist a uh, wonderful pianist in, in the bay area he he after the show he said um at a restaurant because we all hung out after like jen i had a vision like I had a vision that you're just going to bring it all together. Uh, like wh wherever you go next, like, and I ended, up, I ended up moving to New York from there. But he's like, you're going to just bring it all together, <laughs> and like that. That was like I didn't know what he was talking about really, but but that was so exciting and so liberating. Like, was it scary at all? It was terrifying because <laughs> I, I didn't know what form that was. Yeah, right. Yeah, but. Because I didn't know what I was doing on the stage. I was like dancing and then like playing some vi a violin part and singing. I had no idea whether it was good or what it looked like, and very insecure feeling, you know, and scary. And but then to to have him just give me that little ounce of confidence and like seeing the future, yeah. like you that. Can consolidate, yeah. You can. And so yeah. integration is always yeah. like after moving to New York, like that's. What I, I and especially when you travel, uh, and 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 like spending so much time in Indonesia and like all the gamelan music, they play every it's instrument. Mm. They also sing and they dance. Mm. You know, they, and the dalangs, who are the the puppeteers, they sing and they know all the instruments. They can play everything. You know, it's it's like of course it's not yeah. a big deal. And yeah. it's they couldn't and and they say like oh you can't just know this part. You have to learn that and. Mm these other parts for sure, you know, or else mm -hmm. you're not going to understand the, the music. So, so that really shifted my mindset and then changed. Um, yeah. And kind of letting go of those, those like kind of perfectionist, precious the categories. Yeah. Right? And, and just like the, the concern of, of not getting this one thing right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually the, the whole. And so anyway, yeah. So I think we're kind of uh, getting close to the end of our time, but as we kind of approach that, I want to hear from each of you about, um, you know, we started out this conversation talking about what your relationship with jazz is at the start. And so I'm curious to hear about what your relationship is with it now, um, especially this idea of like the jazz label or genre being applied to your work. Um, and, you know, how do you feel like you fit in with that? And you know, what's your relationship with like what jazz is and how you feel like you're pulling it forward? Or do you feel like that's even the right way to put it? Oh, we need like another two hours. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely. Well, yeah, I'll just say for me, I think the term jazz is it's extremely fascinating to me. Um, I have yo-yoed with it. I've gone in and out of, of like, I've, I've been really attracted to it, really proud of it, felt completely like disdainful of that term. Um, and now I feel like it, I'm just so fascinated. I'm just, I, I think it's, it, the fact that it eats everything and refuses to be defined mm -hmm. and the fact that people want to define it and fight over what it means and the fact that it's so maligned by the industry and nobody cares about it and people think it's not cool and people think it's traditional and they think it's cocktail music or they think it's you know too complicated like all of those things make me so just i just i just want to read more about it and know more about it and listen to it more and not know what it is and i don't know i think it's it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
it's a mess. It's a total mess. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's weird because it's like when someone says, oh, you're a jazz musician, I think most people that I know, well, actually, a lot of people that I know will go, really? <laughs> I don't know if you could say, if you could qualify it. You know. So I just think even just that reaction mm -hmm. is so interesting, mm -hmm. so fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I have many, yeah, so many <laughs> thoughts. But I think, the, I mean, there's many reasons for, for people having that reaction. And I'm realizing that one of it is the word itself because mm -hmm. many of us are starting to learn its origins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And its origins was white people making fun of black people for playing mm -hmm. the music, you know, like literally it's a bad word mm -hmm. <laughs> that they shortened to jazz. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like the but even that is like you kind but of it's silly. I mean, that. it's dumb. Yeah, like it's that. so dumb. Like it's like so part yeah. of our culture. It's yeah, like, and it's, we flipped it. Like we yeah. flip everything else. You yes. know, that's what we do. We yeah. flip it. Yeah, make it work for you. You know, but mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's like you know, it's 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 a little bit. It's a little bit silly. And, and that is the push pull, I think. And it's not, I don't think it's, I think it's like especially heightened in, in our lineage, but it really is present in every format, particularly of, you know, music that exists like from indigenous or black or brown people yes. in a white continent or like a, you know, yeah. white supremacist continent, rather. Yes. Right. Because we hear. But um, yeah. <laughs> like, is that there's always a push pull between making the thing and then them trying to define you and like, yeah. grab it and like hold it and like make sense of the thing you're doing and you're like well like you want people to understand it but also you don't really want it to be that controlled you know yes. so you want to be able to define it you want to be able to yeah. to change if you and that's the other history of it too right it's like it's just artists changing all the time exactly mm -hmm. any of your favorite artists is like they just changed 70 times some of those yeah. changes i don't really like them records but yeah. i'm glad they changed you know exactly. and that's yeah. for me what it means it's like yeah. and that's the wayne shorter that, right yeah. i dare you that's yeah. what he says it is which mm -hmm. i like it's like i change. love that mm -hmm. but speaking to that even i would i would venture to say that i think a lot of people would categorize what we do as jazz but there are groups of people many probably yeah. who would yes. say yes. these yes. are definitely not these three people are not jazz musicians, <laughs> <That's> right, <laughs> right? they're not playing jazz right. so it's yeah. it's a funky little thing right yeah. yeah and i think if we focus more on like well i don't know like you have such a sound and creative mind and cecile has such a like i really feel like it's this force like the force of cecile and the force of samora and and the force of all these artists that we have you know learned from whether it's from the recordings or you know just conversations like it's it's so it's so profound you know and 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 i couldn't possibly categorize have one word to you know Although creative music is an interesting, what do you think of that term? Uh, uh, the only reason I have trouble is because I'm like, what isn't creative music? Know. But you know, that's I think the problem with all the terms because yeah. yeah. like, but what I I think what I do hear you saying, which I do really connect to, is that I think I really connect to the lineage mm -hmm. that people also name that. Yeah, and I don't ever want to yes. let go of that. Right, I really. Like those are my people. Yes. And then I also, and this is something I don't know that I always would have said, but I'm also deeply excited about being in community with other people that people would define as that now. Mm -hmm. And obviously yeah. right. y'all are, you know, that's like, <laughs> right. it's like, those are, I definitely, I'm like, mm -hmm. that's what I want. I want to be a part of like that conversation in that yeah. community. That's when you talk about community, I think that's what it is for me. I'll, the only other thing too that I'll say too is, it became a lot easier for me to ex accept, um, well, it became a lot easier for me when I decided to start making different, dis like working in different artistic disciplines mm -hmm. that weren't just music. Right. Because then I was like, now I'm not just like making hell of different genres that no one like knows what my music is. Cause that's mostly the reaction I get is like, where does this, yeah. I don't mm -hmm. really know where to put this. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, now you really don't. Now you really <laughs> yeah. don't. Know. Yeah. And I kind of like that. Yeah. Like, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to Sumi Tanoka, who's my partner mm -hmm. in crime for, um, for the project that brought us together. I mean, Creative Inflections, mm -hmm. supported by Doris Duke. And, um, you know, Sumi, her first gig was at 19 with Philly Joe Jones. Like, that was wow. her first professional mm -hmm. gig and going on the road with him and all the stories and, and you know she and we talk about this a lot like what is jazz and how are we 
collaborating and why, why is it so easy for us to improvise together and you know and just tra talking about her also her explorations into her her ancestry as as both you know her father was african-american her mother was japanese and and just like you know how, how the stories that she's telling through her playing and mm -hmm. um you know i just it i just really see such complete art like these individuals and now i'm rereading robin kelly's monk mm, book the, the you know the greatest, the greatest and and just seeing you know how he was battling with same stuff, same yeah. stuff and like yeah. people getting more play than him and him feeling like frustrated that he wasn't you know being regarded as as, as influential as he was and it's like wow and, and just how he i mean i feel like most of the book is him struggling like to you know it, it's really crazy to, to know how much he struggled and um and and just like that's why history is so important you know mm -hmm. for us not to forget that journey and for robin mm -hmm. to have written the done the research you know yes. um yeah so it's uh i, I don't know how to wrap that up but <laughs> <laughs> we out here <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, to that point um yeah do any of you like have uh, like an album or any shows coming up that you would like to mention before we before we wrap up tour like tour anything um, like that i would just like to shout out the project that doris duke is supporting that i'm doing which is uh ogress which is a uh murder ballad about Ooh. a woman living in the woods who eats people when they come to attack her we're making it into feature length film and we're uh, going to perform it, uh, a live version of it at the at the Walker in Minneapolis. So okay. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Yay. Such a great museum and oh, place. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the M3, uh, we have our big festival in June. Definitely want to um, give a shout out. And uh, June 16th, 17th, 18th, 21st, and then the gala of the 22nd at Greenwich House Music School. And um, and of course, Sumi, our project, we're still in the research phase. Um, we've interviewed Jenny Lim and Toshiko Akiyoshi, and Amina Claudia Myers is on our net let next on our list. <laughs> the amazing Amina. So um, so yeah, and that the piece we're creating is is called In the Green Room: Layering Legacies of Black and Asian American Jazz Women Jazz Musicians, mm -hmm. and um, and kind of alongside that, I'm, I'm, I should be finishing this year um, uh, a piece for 20 uh, orchestral members who will serve as choir also. And we'll be moving and acting uh, in a piece called Fertile Land, Fertile Body about fertility, its connection to the land and uh, climate crisis. And it'll be an orchestra of, of yeah, 20 women and non-binary artists whom I haven't selected yet, but will. <laughs> but yeah, that's, so that's kind of happening. Probably will be the next album cool. as well, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> so excited. No, I just want to experience all those things. That's really, but um, yeah, I'm the, the project that, that Doris Duke, um, among others, helped, to, uh, helped me to create um, is called The Healing Project. And that is, um, it basically is in, comes in three parts. So the first part is an exhibition, which is currently on view in San Francisco at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts mm -hmm. until September 4th. And um, it is free and open to the public, which I am like so excited about. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. um, then hopefully after that, it will travel to other cities. Um, then there's also a digital archive which we just launched last week, which anybody can find at healingprojectarchive.com. Mm -hmm. And then the last piece is my album, which is called Grief, um, which people can find anywhere that you find music. <laughs> yeah, and they should buy that album Please instead buy of streaming it. it. Please yes. buy it. Thank yes. you. Exactly. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, or, yeah. yeah. Support the musicians. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, well, thank you all so much for being so generous with your time and taking the time to speak with me today. Uh, this is really wonderful. Um, thanks, everyone out in the rest of the world for joining us today. Uh, like I said, please buy these artists' music. Don't just stream it. Uh, if they are coming through your town, buy, buy a ticket, buy a friend a ticket. 
thank you so much to the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation for having us and helping us put this on. Uh, we've got and also oh. um, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, right? Who is part of your and Walker Art Center and Asia Society. I just want to make sure I got got that in there. <laughs> Great, Great. Thank, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've got uh, Cecile McLaurin Salvant, Jen Shu, and Samora Pinderhughes. I'm Allison Hussey with Pitchfork, and see you down the road.